decoding the sonic xenomorph. <laughs> Origins of xenomorph in electromagnetic sonorous objects. The xenomorphic sound objects created by Lewis and B.B. Barron for the score of Forbidden Planet in 1956 are products of a ritualistic cybernetic programming that includes the Barron's systematic torture and autopsy of alien sound beings. The Barrons considered their circuits to be basic life forms and noted similarities between the electronic and psychological functionality of their circuit board patches. We would do the craziest things, B.B. describes. Those circuits were really alive. They would shriek and coo and have little lifespans of their own. It was just amazing. They would start out and reach a kind of climax and then they would die and you could never resurrect them. Lewis regarded the program circuit patches as biomorphic doubles. We design and construct electronic circuits which function electronically in a manner remarkably similar to the way that lower life forms function psychologically. Most remarkable is that the sounds which emanate from these electronic nervous systems seem to convey strong emotional meaning to listeners. Pushing past simple anthropomorphism to comprehend instead a form of biomedia, their recollections consistently turn morbid. Lewis and Beebe agree that you have to be free to abuse the circuit. Fortunately, tubes are forgiving. Lewis goes on to reflect, we can torture these circuits without a guilty conscience, whereas if we did it musically, we might have to torture a musician. We look on these circuits as generally suffering, but we don't feel compassion. In the most extreme cases, the Barons describe a calculated cruelty. The thing would just be tortured to death. You could really hear it. The sounds of a tortured homemade circuit suggested to Bibi the last paroxysms of a living creature. The abuse, torture, and paroxysms are followed up by an autopsy that eliminates residual significance of the sonorous object and determines its potential for future weaponization of an alien electroacoustic ecology. The sonic xenomorph has its origins in Bernard Herrmann's score to the 1951 film The Day the Earth Stood Still. The alien ambassador Claytu's ability to manipulate time, space, and the physics of electromagnetic attraction leads to a grand scene of cinematic stasis. As washing machines, dairy equipment, printing presses, factories, and vehicles all over the world suddenly stop working, Herman knew that the score had to provide a sense of the invisible alien forces at work at this dramatic crux. Rather than overcompensate for the stillness with a frantic score, the composer creates a minute of frozen music. His tape composition, the first of its kind in a Hollywood film, suggests concrete manipulation and mixing of recorded sounds as artistic practices in their own right. One of his signature effects involved the isolation of the sounds of acoustic instruments. Film music was typically recorded in a studio setting that contributed to a natural harmonic interaction as distinct instrumental voices resonate with each other, creating a rich field of overtones that occupy the same acoustic space. Herman effectively cancels this interplay by recording various instruments separately. Alienating each voice from the other, the composer prohibits the resonance of inter-instrumental communication, first isolating distinct sound events in the recording studio and then capturing them on separate channels of magnetic tape. Herman cuts off the attack of an instrumental sound on tape, emphasizing what Stephen Hussarek calls, quote, the residual ambience of each note and then makes that ambient residue its own compositional element. Herman removes or alters the timbral properties of sounds from their source material by reversing, filtering, and remixing his sounds, the magnetic tape operating in the manner of electronically generated sounds. This provides an opportunity to recompose a new kind of musical communication in an artificial and alien sound space, one of a predominantly electromagnetic timbre. As the Earth succumbs to Plato's alien command, the score can only be heard in terms of its alien electronic sensibilities. The human instruments in the score had previously emphasized an emotional subcurrent that erupts into moments of brute, grossly hands-on performance and vivid counterpoint to the hands-free and ethereal theremin. A violent and ugly banging on pianos, drums, and gongs provided the source content for the magnetic pool sequence, portraying humans as musical primitives. 
This aggression isn't removed once the sounds are captured through the magnetic pull of the tape recorder, but rather electrified and so made susceptible to and refined by alien manipulation. Forbidden Planet also plays out along an electromagnetic substrate where the unseen and menacing id monster roams for much of the film as nothing other than invisible electronic tones. The Barons combined a generative method for deriving new sounds from overdriven circuit designs encountered with tape mixing techniques that altered the speed of sound, reverse tapes, looped tapes, sliced tape to envelop the attack and decays of sounds, and manually created effects like echo and delay. Electromagnetic sounds with acousmatically reduced signification prove especially ripe for appropriation and resignification relative to the cinematic event to which they add value. But by lacking residual associations, new electronic sounds prove especially qualified for attaching to the unusual images and events of the science fiction film, particularly those of invisible psychotechnologies. While direct references to Freudian psychoanalysis and what B.B. Barron called all the psychological stuff about dreams were ultimately cut from Forbidden Planet, the Barron's practice retains a Freudian subtext even as it points beyond the usefulness of psychoanalysis and ends up articulating a form of interspecies communication as schizoanalytic mechanism. In Chaosmosis, Felix uh, Guattari establishes his concern with the phylogenetic evolution of, mesh, of machinism by framing two overlapping and mutually contingent forms, the mechanosphere and biosphere, both in fact autopoetic living machines capable of generating, maintaining, and expanding their own internal organization and external boundary limits. Here, Guattari prods Francisco Varela's thoughts about the biological constraints of autopoetic organization to get at something more inclusive of non-organic systems and machinic heterogeneity. Autopoiesis and differentiation suggest some of the ways in which machinic autonomy accommodates diverse mediums of alterity through various contingent processes of autogenesis, the production of being through social systems and technical machines. The Baron's practical contributions to a speculative cybernetics are largely overlooked, and I'm interested in their production of the Forbidden Planet score less as an endeavor in electronic music making, however unconventional, than an experiment in sonic cybernetics that stages an encounter with an alien biocomputer. Beebe describes a clinical depth analysis of a patch, tape manipulation uncovering otherwise hidden sonic depths and behavioral subroutines, while variable tape speeds expose the latent patterns of echo rhythms, microglossandi, and noisy artifacts of the recording process. At once innovative and harrowing, the Barons discover black noise, the sonorous object-oriented phenomena that Ian Bogos argues takes shape among the, quote, muffled objects hovering at the fringes of our attention, end quote. Black noise frames our experience of alien objects and phenomena in their state of xenomorphic withdrawal, and Bogos suggests that we must amplify the black noise of objects to make the resonant frequencies of the stuffs inside them hum in incredibly satisfying ways. Echoing the Baron's practice as much as it does, something menacing lurks within this amplification of alien feedback circuits to make them seen. Motific, uh, motific expressivity of circuits has everything to do with an overdriven metaprogramming, black noise feedback loops, and the dissection of alien life. viral sonorous hyperobjects. In Ridley Scott's 1979 film Alien, Dolby multi-channel sound design allows for startlingly rapid mutations of diegetic space. The expanded spatial sound design contributes to an elusiveness while at the same time fosters a concrete realism, presence, and embodiment. A heartbeat sound precedes the attacks of the alien and functions as an effective motif though it is never exactly clear from what point of audition we perceive it. This sound borrows from the sensibilities of the horror film score and the musical conventions that exacerbate the disjunctions of narrative, the fracturing of character, unexpected scenic atmospheres, and spectacles of excessive violence and horror. But this process turns particularly malignant as sound effects and music combine to form not only a ubiquitous atmosphere, but what William Whittington calls a singular organism of sound. Never knowing 
what or where the sonic xenomorph will emerge, we become hyper aware of the surrounding sonic field while we both attune to it and remain guarded against it. Alien modulation works against what Shaviro calls the constraints of locality. In both Alien and John Carpenter's The Thing from 1982, the sonic xenomorph dislocates time, space, and scale. It emerges without apparent origin or source across a vast sonorous hyperobject, um, the relational space of post-cinematic affect. In most of Carpenter's films, minimalist droning synthesizers, something between a humming power line and a human heartbeat, reduces music to a raw undercurrent. It's as if the only thing Carpenter's version of the thing retains from its 1951 source is the electric carrot bug zapper that blows out the original invader from another world. The ambient ecologies of the science fiction horror film are full of such primal sound triggers. Desolate arctic winds undercut by the synthetic drone in the thing and the out of place water sounds in the depths of the spaceship Nostromo or the alien wind created from a conch shell sourced through an echoplex uh, effects unit, amplify the terrestrial roots of alien xenomorphic foreboding and dread. The wind both envelops and isolates, charging the atmosphere with its synthetic presence and insistent heartbeat pulse. This music acts as the unseen but ever-present metamorphic thing that rides on the high-fidelity multi-channel carrier wave of the Dolby system. Dolby Surround reaffirms the presence of precisely the kind of sounds and noises, ambient background hums, electric buzzes, and wind, for instance, that had largely been dropped from the soundtracks in order to make dialogue, musical cues, and other sound events audible within the limited frequency range of mono and stereo equipped cinemas. But surround sound is not only a matter of sonic placement, but also of tonality, timbre, and rhythm. One of sound designer Walter Murch's innovative contributions to sound design in George Lucas's THX 113A was the use of polyrhythm and polytonality to suspend sounds in a shared space and so create multiple centers of attention. Before Dolby Surround made this ubiquitous, Murch's practice had already created what Mike, uh, Michel Chion calls a profound shift in cinematic listening by dispensing with the idea of a single rhythmic center to a film as it takes advantage of this proliferation of polyrhythmic events and decenters the film, Dolby Surround allows for multiple types and intensities of simultaneous sounds to inhabit the same cinematic space. The new surround sound loudspeaker technologies that premiered with Alien in the cinema and with the Thane for the home theater reconfigure cinematic experiences as the multimodal alien point of audition of the sonorous hyperobject. Timothy Morton's work on hyperobjects suggests ways to track these unusual sound entities, partly because his work sketches out a taxonomical topography of the hyperobject that is preeminently sonic and experienced as profoundly alien. He lists five attributes of hyperobject viscosity, non locality, temporal undulation, phasing, and interobjectivity. Viscosity speaks to the stickiness of the sonorous hyperobject, which surrounds us while attached to narratives about dissembled, fragmented, and discontinuous beings. Viscous sound exploits a complementarity of uncanny sounds, which sit neither here nor there in diegetic space to form an invisible quantum connectivity across speaker locations over the course of a film. This generates an alien goo of, resi of residual signification out of which might burst anywhere a renewed form of alien malevolence. As embodied experience of the non-local, these cinematic sonorous objects map the primary sounds of pumping blood, breathing, the high-pitched whine of the nervous system, and tinnitus. The non-local nature of, of these sounds ensures that when we perceive a trace, an undulation works with and against a strong phase effect, another process of non-referentiality by which sonorous hyperobjects end up removed from anything other than the concrete self-reference of the theme. The weaponized sonic xenomorph. <clears throat> 
director Musha and writer-producer Klaus Max Decoder from 1984 takes place in a psychogeographical middle ground that results from media saturation and pervasive ambient psychotechnologies. Set amid the real-world sleeves of Hamburg's Reeperbahn district, West German corporate headquarters sprawl, and the industrial wastelands of Berlin, this obscure cyberpunk tale of sonic terrorism pits an industrial noise freak against the corporate fascism of the Muzak company. Mike's research took him to several corporate offices in, we in major West German cities, and he managed to interview a company director. But the provocative questions he had meant to ask melted away under the influence of the sonic Valium. Muzak worked. This was not music which is meant to entertain, because music is art, but music is science. So it does not require a conscious listening effort, yet it has an enormous effect on those who hear it. That was from Muzak's own um, brochure. This was scientifically engineered sound that modulated consciousness for better productivity and deeper relaxation. What most disturbed Mike was its ubiquitous presence characterized by the company's catchphrase, Muzak is more than music, it's an environment. An ambient tool for collective social control, Muzak synchronized the human biorhythm as well as conditioned mood, which it extended everywhere through its pervasive presence. Decoder follows the sound experiments and interventions of FM a human frequency modulator played by F.M. Einheit, also known as Mufti of West Berlin's Einstrasende Neubotten. Fueled by a post-punk mixture of Barosian tape experiments and chaos magic, F.M. learns to resist the synthetic atmospheres of contemporary mass consumption through sonic interventions and eventually develops industrial anti-music. The noise collages Monte Cazaza is credited with coining the term industrial music which Genesis Bjorge declared would be an anti-Muzak that, instead of cushioning the sounds of a factory environment, made use of those very sounds to create rhythmic patterns and structures that incorporated the liberating effects of music by unexpected means. That's the end of Genesis's quote. Cut-ups and noise experiments brings, music, uh, brings magic ritual to sound engineering. FM's antics grow wilder and more disturbing while working at his mixing desk. He begins to use his entire body to manipulate and interfere with his tape recordings. In the most disturbing sequence in the film, he tortures one of his partner Christina's pet frogs, recording its screams, and finally squeezes it to death. This triggers a spastic frenzy of motion, swinging arms wildly, spinning around, banging fists onto equipment, and at last smearing what appears to be shit or frog guts onto his face. Mike was inspired by Burroughs' instructions for the use of infrasound in the revised Boy Scout manual and Throbbing Gristle's use of extremely low frequencies, and he entertained the possibility of provoking physical discomfort among his theater audience, especially in the scenes set at a burger joint where FM works. Muzak achieves its seemingly innocuous ubiquity because it operates through sonic cancel cancellation and subtractive compression and lacks high and low frequencies. Accordingly, Mike wanted to include recordings of very low bass frequencies and infrasonic sound throughout the film's score, but movie theater loudspeakers were too limited to reproduce them and he abandoned the idea. Nonetheless, Decoder begins with a pair of unsettling dissonant sounds. Desolate electronic wind noise occupies the high range, while a sustained low frequency drone, though by no means infrasonic, rumbles underneath. There are no mid-range frequencies at all, making this a perfectly well-constructed anti-Muzak that fills in the audible spectrum precisely where Muzak drops out. Running for more than three minutes, the low throb threatens to modulate and distort other sounds, such as the electronic drum machine that fades into the mix. This is less an instance in which music adds to the visual experience than evidence of synthesized sound's capacity to invisibly alter other sounds. By the time Burroughs published the West German edition of the Electronic Revolution in 1970, the cassette tape recorder had already become a frontline weapon that could be used to produce and escalate riots. Demonstrators armed with portable tape recorders could wreak havoc by playing pre-recorded noises of riot and violence, Burroughs argued. Mike had intended Decoder in its accompanying handbook to provide an instruction manual for media revolution and an industrial techno spell that would morph reality through sympathetic magic. Anticipating Ronald Reagan's visit to Berlin in 1982, Mike uh, planned to stage his own sonic intervention with actors carrying around cassette players. That would be the end of his film. But when you cut into the present, Burroughs announced, the future leaks out. Reality preceded Mike's script. 
When he arrived on location, local anarchists and protesters were already on the scene, playing tapes with recordings of gunshots, explosions, and helicopters. Police broke or confiscated 200 recorders, by Mike's estimation, and footage and sounds of the Berlin riots worked their way into his film, which had gone from science fiction to documentary proof of anti muzak